Hi and welcome to this preparation course on the AWS Solution Architect Associate. So now what is this course all about? So I've just created this small course which is kind of a preparation course before you take on the actual exam. So this takes into consideration that you have already taken a training course on the AWS Solution Architect Associate. This is the Feb release, the new release of the exam and you are now looking at taking the actual certification exam. Now this course I said is just a short preparation course just before the exam. I will discuss the key concepts which gets asked in the exam and how they map to the exam objectives. This should give you an extra level of confidence when going into the exam so that you understand what are the core concepts that get questioned on the exam. Now just to let the students know that I do have expertise on the exam, I am just letting you all know that I have given the new exam release, the Feb 2008 release exam two times. So I gave it first when it was first released in Feb. So this was on Feb 15th when I gave the exam. And then I recently again gave the exam in July uh, and again the reason that I keep on giving this exam multiple times is because I want to create courses uh, and content for exam questions for students so that they are better prepared for the exam itself. I just want to let you all know that uh, on the side I do create question banks for a couple of vendors and companies. So these are companies which actually publish question banks on the AWS exams and I normally ghost write or write these question banks for them. So I have written question banks on all of the AWS certification exams. I've also written question banks on the Azure exams. So I am very well versed in creating question banks and content for those students who wish to take and pass the exam. If you look at my AWS Solution Architect course which is available on the Udemy platform, so currently it's still uh, pertaining to the old exam content, I still have to update it. But if you look at the comments on the course, you will see that a lot of people have actually passed when taking that course. And that's the entire idea behind my courses and questions is to ensure students have a better chance of passing their exam. So now let's go on and start with this course. Hi and welcome back. So now in this chapter, let's go through the storage options which are available in AWS and let's map this to the objectives in the exam. So when you look at the key objectives which map to storage, so we have domain one which is resilient architectures. So in here you have one of the objectives as choosing reliable and resilient storage. You also have domain two where you have to choose storage which is high in performance not only for your underlying service but also for your databases. And finally there is also a part of designing cost optimized architecture. So in here also you will see that there is an option for designing cost optimized storage. So you can see that you have these storage options in three of the domains and it's split between these domains. So you could expect questions which could ask you concepts behind each of these objectives. And you can see there is a large percentage which is dedicated to domain one and domain two. So let's go ahead and understand the different storage options. So first you have object level storage. So object level storage, you have the simple storage service and Amazon Glacier. In block level storage, you have the elastic block storage volumes, which can be attached to your EC2 instances. And then you finally have the databases, which is your Amazon relational database service, DynamoDB, Aurora and Redshift. Now for me, when I am answering questions, I go through the question over and over again, just to get some key terms in the question. Sometimes in the questions you will see, design 
an architecture which has object level storage. So this key term of object level storage should automatically direct your thoughts towards using either the simple storage service or Glacier. So sometimes look for these key terms in the question itself in the exam. This would help you better understand or limit the options for the answers and then help you pick the right answer in the end. So let's go to object level storage which is a simple storage service. So when you map it to the first domain which is resilient storage, remember that the simple storage service has high durability and availability. How does the simple storage service achieve this? Well, when you use the S3 service to upload an object to a bucket, in the background, what the simple storage service does, it actually copies that same object onto multiple physical devices. Only when the copy is done to all physical devices, then you get a result saying that yes, your object is securely stored in the simple storage service. So in case if one of the physical entities goes down, the other ones are still available. And this is how the simple storage service achieves high durability and availability for your underlying objects. So if you're looking for object level storage, which has high durability and availability, think of the simple storage service. So we've already looked at the advantages wherein if one device fails, the object would still be present on another device. One key point to note here is that this replication is only available within a particular region. If you have a disaster recovery scenario in which you have really critical data. So if you have in the question saying it's critical data, it needs to be available all the time even if the region goes down, then the simple storage service also has a facility known as cross region replication for a particular bucket in which the objects, so when you copy an object to a bucket in one region, it automatically can be replicated or copied onto a bucket in another destination region. This will be done automatically for you. Some key concepts which I hope you have learned in training is that you have to enable versioning on the bucket. This is a prerequisite to ensure that objects can be copied onto another bucket in cross region replication. Also, if you have already existing objects in the bucket, those will not be replicated. So if you want to have replication for your objects from the very beginning, ensure that you first enable cross region replication and then start uploading objects in your primary bucket. Now, apart from Amazon S3, we also have Amazon Glacier. So this is used for archive object storage. This is a very cost effective option. If you're looking to archive your files and your data. Now they have this standard retrieval process from Glacier wherein after uploading an object onto Glacier, if you want to download the object, you have to submit something known as a job. And then the objects which you want to retrieve would be available after three to five hours. So this is the catch when you actually have cold storage or archive storage. It is cost effective. But one key thing to note is that if you want to retrieve something back, it takes three to five hours. This is very important from an exam perspective. So if you have a question wherein it says that it's acceptable to download objects after maybe five hours or three hours and you want a cost effective option, then you can choose Amazon Glacier. But in case if you want to retrieve objects even faster, now there are two ways. First thing, there's something known as expedited retrieval in Amazon Glacier. Here you can actually get the objects back in a matter of minutes, but you have to pay extra. The other way which I don't have in the slide is that if one of the options in the exam or in the question says that you could use Amazon S3 infrequent access, 
So Amazon Glacier expedited retrieval is not part of the options of that question. Then choose the infrequent access because that gives you cost effectiveness. It also allows you to uh, download the objects much quicker. Obviously Amazon Glacier is much cheaper than infrequent access. But again, depending upon the options which you have for the question, choose them accordingly. And then remember that to transfer data onto Amazon Glacier, there are two ways. Either you could use the API or you could use lifecycle policies which are defined in S3. Remember that you can't use the AWS console to upload objects onto Amazon Glacier. You either have to use the application programming interface or lifecycle policies. Now let's go to EBS volumes. Now EBS volumes don't have the same level of durability as a simple storage service. This is very important to understand. Now in an availability zone, when you create an EBS volume, it is replicated to multiple devices in that availability zone. But if that zone fails for any reason whatsoever, your volume will not be available. So sometimes in questions you will see how can you safeguard your data on an EBS volume? Because this is your job. This is not the job of AWS. What you can do is that you can create EBS snapshots. This will be an answer option. And you can also copy the snapshots onto another region for disaster recovery purposes. Remember that you directly cannot create a snapshot in another region. You have to first create the snapshot and then use the copy snapshot option to copy the snapshot onto a different region. These two steps are important to know from an exam perspective. Now when it comes to the objectives of performance storage and also cost optimized storage, you will get a few questions when it comes to EBS volumes. So let's understand this in more detail. Now we have four types of volumes in EBS. So you have the general purpose SSD, you have the provision IOPS, you have the throughput optimized HDD, and finally you have the coal HDD. So let's understand when you would use the different underlying volume types. Let's say you have an EC2 instance, it's hosting a web server, it has a predictable workload. In such a case, you are asked in the question, what is the most cost effective volume type you will use for the underlying EBS volumes, you would choose general purpose SSD. This is good to use for predictable workloads such as web servers where you don't have much input output operations on the EBS volumes. That time you will choose general purpose SSD. You will not choose provision IOPS because that is not cost optimized. General provision IOPS is more expensive than general purpose SSD. So remember that when you were asked in the question regarding both cost optimized and performance storage to choose the right option accordingly. Now let's look at the other classification of the EBS volume type. So let's say you have an EC2 instance. It has a database server. This is resource intensive. Now these are key words you have to see in the question. In the question it will say that you have a resource intensive workload on an EC2 instance. There is a high number of input and output operations. All keywords that you can see in a question. Now before we can actually go ahead and decide on what is the underlying EBS volume, I want to bring a small note on what is the meaning of a high number of input and output operations. What's the difference between the database server and a web server? So a web server normally would deliver your web pages, you request web pages and it just picks up the content, processes it and gives it to you. But in the database, what do you normally do? So you would normally fire select statements. This is equivalent to a read operation. You could also perform update, insert and delete statements, which is a write operation. So this is a very simple case of a database. Now when you're performing this read and write operations, what the database engine, let's say it's an Oracle database, what will it do internally? Well, it will anyway go to its underlying volumes, right, which is stored on the EC2 instance. 
if you're firing the select statement, it will search for the data on the volume. If you're using an update, insert or delete statement, it needs to write the data on the underlying volume. So in the end, the database again has to access the underlying volume, the disk on which the data resides. And this job of reading and writing data is actually a job of something known as a device, known as an input output controller. And this can take a lot of strain if you have a lot of read and write operations because the input output controller has to search on the disk where to read the data from, where to write the data. And when you have a lot, many number of select, update, insert and delete statements, then the controller starts lagging behind and you start taking a performance hit. So in such a case, you should use the provision IOPS volumes. That's because these volumes have been designed in such a way that it makes it more easier to do the input and output operations. It's actually especially built for this purpose and it gives you higher performance on your underlying volumes. Obviously, you do need to pay more when compared to the general purpose SSD. But when you get a question, you will get it based on performance. So you have to choose provision IOPS has the underlying EBS volume type. Next, let's take the next use case scenario. So we have an EC2 instance. This time we're having some sort of processing application on the server. It's used for processing videos. Now when you're processing videos, the videos could be taken from an external location. It will be uploaded to your EC2 instance. These videos could be large in size. These videos could be streamed from another device or application or another node. In such a case, you need high throughput. So throughput means that the number of the amount of data which is coming in and out of your instance is a lot. So it's not the processing power. So it is not the amount of input and output that's occurring on the disk. So you're not writing uh, frequently to the disk. This time it's the amount of data that you're actually writing and reading from the disk. So it's a chunks of data which is large in size. So in such a case, this is known as high throughput. What we do is, you guess it right, it is throughput optimized HDD. So in a question, you would get this figure saying that we want to have an EBS volume type which has high throughput of let's say 400 megabytes per second. So this is the amount of data ca that can be transferred onto the instance per second. So this is good for large streaming data such as videos, images, you know, audio, etc. This is more cost effective than using provision IOPS. And then finally to end all of this off, we have the coal HD. This is for infrequently accessed storage. This is also optimized for throughput, but this is more for infrequent access. So let's take a use case scenario. Let's say you have a user uploading videos. It's the same as our previous case. The videos get stored on the EBS volumes. They get access very frequently over a period of two months, but then after that, they start getting access less frequently. What would you do? So if you want to store these videos only on the EC2 instance, you can have two separate volumes. You can store the videos for two months on the volume, which is of the EBS type throughput optimized HDD. And after two months, you can have a script which transfers the video onto another volume, which is of type Cole HDD. Overall, you have the perfect solution when it comes to performance storage. At the same time, you're also optimizing on cost because if you're to store the videos on throughput optimized HDD even after two months, you're simply paying for extra storage when the data is not being accessed that frequently. Right, so in this chapter, we have looked at how to map the objectives, what are the type of questions you will be asked when it comes to the simple storage service and EBS volumes. Let's move on to the next chapter. Hi and welcome back. So now in continuation to the objectives which are mapped in the exam, 
Let's look at the database options which are available in AWS. So again, we are going to look at the same objectives, but we're going to add one more. So this time we've added point 1.4, which is to determine how to design high availability. High availability is very important when it comes to databases in the exam. So I've seen quite a number of questions when it comes to high availability for databases. So let's look at the Amazon Relational Database Service. So we have the service available for Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, the MySQL, PostgreSQL, and MariaDB. We also have Amazon Aurora, we have Amazon DynamoDB, and we have Redshift. So let's discuss each of these in a little bit more detail. When would you want to use the Amazon Relation Database Service? Let's say you have an existing database. So this could be, let's say, an Oracle workload, which you currently have in your on-premise location. You know, sometimes a large number of companies already have a lot of their data on their on-premise environment. If they want to move to the cloud, they sometimes want to migrate the data as it is they do want to have the headache of testing it on a different database engine environment. So they would normally opt for just transferring the Oracle data onto an Oracle database in the relation database service. Here they could use a database migration service. It could be an external tool or they could use the one available with AWS. So when you already have something that's available on premise, you want to just lift and shift as it is, you can use the Oracle database service. Another reason why you might want to use the relational database service is let's say you have a third party application and this has a dependency on only working with certain database engines. So let's say that WordPress is more performant when it works with a PostgreSQL database. In such a scenario, you might want to then spin up the Postgres database in the relation database service. Another reason could be the skill sets of the developers which you have in your company. Let's say they don't have the skill sets to work with DynamoDB. Now there's a lot of talk about DynamoDB. So let's say you as a company are excited to start using the DynamoDB service. So you want to maybe make a transition of your application from your on-premise onto AWS and then use DynamoDB. But then you have to look at the entire costing perspective. And let's say your developers are not up to speed. They don't know how to work with DynamoDB. You don't have the money or the time to invest in upskilling the developers onto DynamoDB. In such a case, if they are more preferent in let's say MySQL, then you would have to go with one of the solutions which is available in the relation database service. Let's say you have structured data. Now why I put this in bold is because from an exam perspective, it is important. If you have data which is, has schema, you have a lot of table joins, then you should consider using one of the existing relation database service and not DynamoDB. Remember DynamoDB does not support table joins and it is a schema-less database. So remember these key terms. Why I am comparing this with DynamoDB is because you can get this comparison in terms of the answer options for the questions on the exam. And sometimes you have to make a decision on whether to use DynamoDB or maybe use a MySQL relation database solution. And sometimes these key terms of structured data table joins makes a big impact on your decision on what would be the right answer. Next, we come to high availability. So I remember getting quite a number of questions on high availability when it came to the relation database service. So let's say you want high availability for a relation database MySQL database solution. Very easy. Enable the multi AZ feature. So in this feature, you have your primary database which is hosted in one data center. When you enable multi AZ, 
the data gets copied synchronously onto a secondary database onto another data center or availability zone. One, some key things to note is that you don't have access to the secondary or standby database. Only AWS has access to this database. If your primary one fails, then AWS will automatically switch your endpoint to the standby or secondary database. You can't do it on your own. Also, I want to bring about a case. So there is also this option of read replicas. You would have done this in your training. Do not use read replicas if it comes as an option on the exam for high availability. Only enable multi-AZ. Multi-AZ is required for high availability for a relational database service. Another important point, multi-AZ does not replicate the database across regions. So this is multiple availability zones within a particular region. You can also get this as an option to a question in the exam. In such a case, if you want to make your database available in case of a disaster in another region, use your automated backups and your snapshots, copy the snapshots onto another region and then use that snapshot to create a database in case of any disaster in the primary region. So we talked about multi-AZ. Now let's talk about read replicas. So this is available currently with the MySQL. PostgreSQL and MariaDB solutions. So in here, again, you have your primary database and your secondary database. This time you have asynchronous replication onto the secondary DB. What's important is that now you do have access to the second database. So you can use both databases side by side. So you're given another endpoint for your secondary database. Now, when should you use read replicas? Very important when you have performance problems on your primary DB. So let's say you have a reporting application which is taking static reports out of your primary database. The number of users are increasing and the database is taking a hit. What you can do is that you can create an exact read replica of the database. Make it has a secondary database. Make your reporting application split the workload across both the databases. So the read operations will not be directed towards the entire primary DB. You could also go against a secondary database. Or in other case, let's say you have an application which is doing both reading of data and updating of data. You can make the application update the data in the primary DB and you can use the reporting application which gets the queries from the secondary database. So this is used when you want to offload your amount of read operations on the primary database, that time you should use read replicas. Amazon Aurora. When should you use the Amazon Aurora database service? So remember that Amazon Aurora has a MySQL compatible and a PostgreSQL compatible database. If you want a faster MySQL engine, you want better performance, you want to be fully managed. You don't want to manage anything on your own. So if your IT management says they don't have time and resources for maintenance, choose Amazon Aurora. If you have a MySQL solution, if you want high availability, choose Amazon Aurora. Now, when you mean high availability, I want to let you know what Amazon Aurora does under the covers. So when you create an Amazon Aurora database, it actually creates a cluster. Now it also creates something known as a volume cluster. When you write data to an Amazon Aurora database table, what it does is that it actually replicates the data or copies the data onto six volumes. These six volumes are distributed across three availability zones. So that's a high number of volumes. This makes it more highly available so that if any availability zone goes down, the data is still available in the other availability zones. So it will make writes to all the volumes in all the availability zones and it will make a read operation to just one volume cluster in one availability zone. It also has this concept of read replicas. So we have seen the concept of read replicas when it came to the mice, when it came to the uh, relation database service. The same thing applies here. 
you have read replicas also for Amazon Aurora. If you want to offload the reads onto secondary databases, now it does the copying of the data onto these read replicas. The latency is less than 100 milliseconds. This is also an important concept. So if you want less latency for data to be replicated across your different nodes in the cluster, which should be less than 100 milliseconds, choose the Aurora service. Now let's go on to Amazon DynamoDB. When should you use this? So this is when you want to have a fully managed NoSQL database. You are storing documents or JSON related data. When you want fast access to data, so you want to quickly get the data, retrieve data and start using it. You have no joins on your table. You also have the concept of indexes. Remember in DynamoDB, you can define global and local secondary indexes to query the data on different attributes for faster access. It is also very high available and durable. The infrastructure scales automatically based on demand. It's a fully managed service. So in the question, if you see, you want a fully managed NoSQL database, which can scale beyond demand. You don't need to think about the demand. You just put the data in the DynamoDB tables, AWS in the back, and will automatically make sure the servers are scaled for your database table. Another very important concept is this new facility or this new feature of auto scaling. So remember that you have to define the read and write capacity for your DynamoDB table. This gives you the ability to define the amount of input and output that can be defined on your table. This also affects the costing of how much you pay for the DynamoDB table. But let's say, you know, you have an application in the beginning, it's not that widely used. So you put a low amount of read and write capacity. Suddenly after a couple of months, you find the throughput, you know, you're finding throttling errors. You're getting errors on your DynamoDB table. Now, instead of you manually going and changing the read and write capacity, you have this facility of auto scaling. This can be done during the creation of the table, wherein you can say if the utilization of the read or write capacity is going beyond, you know, a particular threshold, then start increasing the units automatically. Remember, automation is a big thing in the industry. So remember that you can get questioned on auto scaling for DynamoDB. Next, let's go on to Amazon Redshift. This is a column based database. This is good when you have aggregation for your data. So let's say you are performing a lot of sum averages, minimum, maximum on your data, and that's a lot of data. Think of using Amazon Redshift. When you want to store historical data, data from different sources, remember this is a petabyte database service which can scale very easily. So if you have a lot of data, this is like a data warehousing solution, choose Redshift. Now, when you have SQL oriented databases like MySQL, Oracle and Microsoft SQL Server, these traditional database systems, remember that the data is stored on the disk row wise. But I said, since this is a column based database, for Redshift, the data is stored on the disk column wise. This is why it makes it more faster to work on your data on a column wide fashion. And that's why I said it's good when you have aggregated or you want to perform aggregation on your data. You can also use business intelligence tools with Redshift, all very key terms for the exam. So all these points come in the question and then you as an architect have to decide what is the most best data store to use for your solution. And if you want to have disaster recovery, this is also a very important point then you can enable something known as cross region snapshots. You can then restore the data onto a new cluster in the new region with this snapshot data. So this marks the end of this chapter where we've looked at the database aspect when it comes to the exam. Let's now move on to the next chapter in this course. Hi and welcome back. So now let's discuss on the compute section so in this, I want to discuss the concepts which align to the objectives of 4.2, which is to determine how to design cost optimized compute and also for choosing design features in solution that enable operational excellence. 
So when you look at compute, so first let's look at instance pricing. So this is something very important to know when you're looking at cost optimized compute options in AWS. So a lot boils down to the instance pricing. So we have on demand instances. So this is good when you have development and test environments. So if you want your instances for a brief period of time, so let's say you have a test environment for a month or a development environment for let's say two months, then you should use on demand. You spot instances when you have batch processing activities. So activities that can survive interruption. When I say interruption is because you do place a bit price on the spot instance. And if you do lose the bit, then you lose the instance. There are other capabilities as hibernation now. But when it comes to the exam, understand that it's only good when you have batch processing activities to use a spot instance. Next, when you know that you need servers 24 by 7 and all throughout the year, you can save cost by purchasing reserved capacity. You also have two other options. So first is dedicated instancing. In this, the instance runs on hardware that's dedicated to a particular customer, right? So this could be a company which has multiple AWS accounts and they have hardware that's dedicated to them. But here, the thing is that if the customer has the multiple AWS accounts, then instances which are launched across these accounts will share the same hardware. There are cases when you want dedicated host, you want a physical server, you want to have complete control. This is used in cases wherein, let's say you have a third party application wherein the licensing is based on the number of cores. You cannot depend upon the concept of V cores or virtual cores, which is provided by AWS. You need to have that concept. And I know this is very strict. I have seen uh, applications which have the strict policy on licensing that you need to have physical cores as part of the contract. In such a case, you have to use dedicated host or maybe you have a security policy which mandates that you cannot share infrastructure with any other instances. In such a case, you have to use dedicated hosts. Next, we have our serverless compute option. So here we have AWS Lambda. This is good when you do want to manage the underlying infrastructure. So you know in AWS Lambda, you only get billed for how much you use. It's very easy to port your existing code and save on cost by using AWS Lambda because you don't need to worry about the costing of your underlying EBS volume or your underlying EC2 instance. You just pay for how much ever you use. Now, normally this Lambda function is used along with the API gateway. So if you do get a question on combination of services, it's always API Gateway along with the AWS Lambda. You can create APIs in the API Gateway service, which can be invoked by customers. And then you can have the APIs invoke the Lambda functions internally. Then we have our Elastic Container Service. And I feel this comes under the operational excellence because now we have microservices and a lot of organizations are using microservices design architecture. So this is used for orchestration of your containers. So instead of you installing an orchestration service like Kubernetes on EC2, you can use the Elastic Container Service to manage all the Docker containers for you. Here you define something known as types. In the type, you mention what is the image that needs to be pulled down. This could be pulled down from Docker Hub or from the uh, elastic container registry, which is available in AWS. And then it deploys containers on managed instances. You can then access all of this via a service. So this is all done automatically for you in the elastic container service. It's a fully managed service. It also has auto scaling capabilities. Very important. If you just want orchestration, to be managed fully for you with auto scaling capabilities, you have to use the Elastic Container Service. So this marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back.
So now in this chapter, I just want to discuss about multi-tier applications. Actually, in particular, I want to discuss about the VPC uh, and how do you actually design your elastic load balancer along with instances. And the reason I want to go through this is because I want to discuss the following objectives which map to these concepts. So in designing resilient architectures, we have this objective of how to design a multi-tier architecture solution and in that how to design high availability of fault tolerant architectures. And in terms of performance, so you have elasticity and scalability. So we'll discuss elasticity when it comes to the load balancer. And then finally, when it comes to securing applications, how would you define the networking infrastructure for a single VPC application? So the use case scenario actually, which I want to discuss maps to these objectives. So let's move forward. So this is a very simple architecture. So you have your VPC, you have a public subnet, you have a private subnet, you could have your web server in the public subnet in one availability zone, you could have your database server in the private subnet, the public subnet have as access to the internet via the internet gateway. A very simple architecture which you would have learned during your course in the AWS Solution Architect Associate. Now let's say you want to introduce a multi-tier architecture, you want to design for elasticity, you want to design for high availability, you would then put a load balancer in front of your web servers. So now what you would do is that you would have multiple private subnets, you would have your web servers in the private subnets. Now why have I put private subnets is because this is good from a security aspect. Remember that if you are putting a load balancer in front of web servers, it's not required to put your web servers in a public subnet. They can be in a private subnet. That's because the load balancer communicates with the underlying web servers via the private IPs and not the public IPs. It's only the load balancer which needs access to the internet gateway and not your underlying web servers. So in this architecture, we have two subnets. So this is very ideal. You need to have multiple subnets for your web servers. Now when you define your load balancer, when you're creating your load balancer, your load balancer should be created in multiple public subnets. Now what the load balancer service does, when you actually create the load balancer in multiple subnets, the load balance service will create multiple load balancer nodes in each of the subnets. This is how the load balancer itself is a highly available device. You don't need to have multiple load balancers for high availability. This is a, a very common question or very common point which gets asked in the exam. If you have a load balancer, do you need to have multiple load balancers for a high available solution? Well, you don't. That's because the load balancer itself is a high available solution. When you create your load balancers, you should specify multiple public subnets if you have an internet facing load balancer. In such a case, what AWS will do, it will create a load balancing node which is used for distributing the traffic and this node will be created in each of these public subnets and these nodes will actually you know uh, distribute the traffic to your underlying web servers this is how the underlying architecture works for you you will only see one dns name or one load balancer but really under the covers what's happening is that the load balance service creates multiple load balancing nodes in multiple subnets which map to multiple availability zones. That is why you always have to create multiple subnets for your load balancer. This is the most effective way to design a solution as an architect. So for a high availability solution, have multiple subnets which map to different availability zones. This can be private for your web servers. Have multiple subnets for different availability zones. If you're using an internet facing load balancer, and if you are using an Amazon 
relation database in addition for your architecture. So let's say your web servers have to talk to a backend database server and you are using an Amazon relation database service. If you want high availability for your entire solution, then you can enable multi-AZ for your relation database service. So as an architect, I am bringing this forward for you to understand that if you have an elastic load balancer, if you have web servers, and if you're using the relation database service, how to enable high availability for your entire architecture. So this marks the end of this chapter. Let's move on to the next chapter in this course. Hi and welcome back. Now in this chapter, we'll just have a quick review on the elasticity and scalability. So in particular, this is pertinent to defining performant architectures. So looking at designing solutions for elasticity and scalability. Now for elasticity, we can use an elastic load balancer. So we know that the load balancer can be used to distribute traffic to underlying EC2 instances. For scalability, you can use an auto scaling group. Now you can launch instances in an auto scaling group based on different metrics. So in addition to normal metrics such as CPU utilization, you can also define your own custom metrics in CloudWatch. So you could have function level metrics because see, it's not always the case that just because your CPU is high or your disk input output is high that the application is having an issue and needs to scale up. It could also be based on the functionality of your application. So you can use the command line interface to publish metrics of your own from your application onto CloudWatch. You can then define alarms based on this and then you could trigger uh, you know, instances in your auto scaling group to scale up or scale down based on these metrics. Now a quick look at the auto scaling policy. So from the perspective of the exam, I want to discuss with you the scheduled scaling policy. So this is used when you want to scale up or scale down at a particular time. So this is based on a schedule. Now some of the use cases in which you can have this, so let's say you have a promotional event for your application, you need to ensure that the infrastructure is scaled before the event itself. You don't want to wait at the last moment to scale the infrastructure, you want it to be scaled up before the event can start. Or another use case scenario, let's say a team is using an application that's defined on a set of instances as part of an auto scaling group, this application experiences, let's say, heavy utilization early on in the day. So this can be a use case scenario when people come to the office, at, let's say at nine o'clock in the morning. And during that time, all of them are using this particular application only at that point in time. And then later on during the day, it's not used that much. What you can do is that to ensure that the users have the best experience early in the morning itself, you can have a schedule scaling policy that increases the instances as part of the auto scaling group early in the morning. And then probably you could add another dynamic scaling policy to decrease it after the utilization goes down. And then we have the dynamic scaling policy. So I said you can scale your instances in your auto scaling group based on metrics. So this could be based on the metrics already available. So like CPU utilization, or you can base this on your own custom metrics. Now, one other important aspect, which I want to discuss from an exam perspective is something known as the cool down timing period. So this is pertinent to the auto scaling group. And what exactly is this cooling down period? So let's say you have three servers that have initially been spun up by the auto scaling group. So this is the minimum number of servers that you specified in the auto scaling launch configuration. Now let's say your performance starts taking a hit, your application is you know, having issues and it's now triggered a CloudWatch alarm at let's say nine o'clock. Now auto scaling as part of this alarm is now spinning up two more servers. So now you have a total of five servers. But now for these two additional servers, new software needs to be installed some scripts need to be run to ensure that these two servers can join the initial three servers 
and start accepting the requests. Now let's say this takes a duration of 10 minutes because obviously when you are scaling up new instances, you need to have something running on it and it needs to be part of that group to start accepting the requests. So let's say this is taking 10 minutes. Now during this time, so let's say again in 5 minutes, because the new servers are not ready, your three servers are still taking a hit and again your CloudWatch alarms have been triggered. What will auto scaling do? Auto scaling will again start spinning up new servers unnecessarily. So instead of now having five servers, you could start having seven servers and this could go on for some particular period of time. So you are not giving enough time for those five servers to settle down. This is where you have the cooling down timer period. So what you can do is that you can increase this time period to ensure that the infrastructure has enough time to settle down. If any CloudWatch alarms are triggered during this period, they will be ignored. This gives enough time for your infrastructure to scale properly and start accepting requests. This is important from an exam perspective. Now when it comes to uh, scalability, so one of the most popular services which is used for decoupling, you would have learned this is the SQS queue service. So it's very simple, you have users, they could be going to your front-end server, your front-end server could be sending messages to an SQS queue and then you have an auto-scaling group which is taking those messages and processing whatever information is required. Now you can trigger scaling of the auto-scaling group even based on the number of messages in the queue. So let's say the number of requests are increasing, your queue length is increasing, the number of servers in the auto-scaling group is not processing the messages in an ideal fashion. You can then set the scaling operation to scale up the number of servers based on the number of messages in the SQS queue. And finally, as part of the objectives, quickly you want to talk about Elastic Cache. You could get a question on this. So in case if you have a front-end server which is talking to a database server or let's say you're just talking to a database server through a reporting application and you are seeing that the performance of the database server is going down and that's because of the same queries which are being fired over and over again. What you can do is that you can place the elastic cache service in front of the database so that the most commonly used data sets of the query get stored in elastic cache and those data sets will be returned to either your front-end servers or directly to your users without putting a strain on the database itself. So this is a very common use case in an architecture in which you could use elastic cache. So this marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. Now let's look at some general security practices which is important from an architect perspective for the exam. So first is using Amazon CloudTrail. This is a very important service from a security perspective. So you know that the AWS CloudTrail service can be used to monitor all API activity from your AWS account. Whether you are issuing API calls either from the SDK or from PowerShell or if you're using the console, everything will be recorded in the AWS CloudTrail service. It's very good when you want to assure compliance for your company. Also, if you suspect any malicious activity in your account, what you can do is that you can check the CloudTrail logs. So let's say there are some resources being spun up which is not supposed to be created. You can see for these API calls in the CloudTrail logs. Now, as an architect, you should always enable CloudTrail logs for all regions. So this also ensures that if any future regions get created by AWS, they automatically get covered. So the API calls will automatically get covered when you enable CloudTrail for all regions. Now it comes to IAM. So when you're creating your IAM users, ensure to give them access based on least privilege. So only what tasks the IAM users are going to do and show that you give them permissions based on those tasks. That's it. 
Use multi-factor authentication wherever possible. Change the password policy. Don't keep the default password policy. So in the password policy, you can mention things like, uh, you know, what are the characters to be specified when creating the password? How long the password should last? The expiry of the password? All of these can be defined in your password policy. Disable the root access keys. For the buckets in S3, you have the bucket policy. So the bucket policy can be used to manage the access via the underlying objects. Even when you're giving access to external AWS accounts, remember that you can do this via the bucket policy. Now, if you want to not give public access to the entire bucket, but you still want to give access to certain objects to certain users, one way of doing this is using pre-signed URLs. So the pre-signed URL in that you can give a time limit for when a user can access an object. Next, we come to IAM roles. So remember, this is used for secure access to your resources. So let's say you have an application on an EC2 instance which needs to access a service like S3 or DynamoDB. Ensure to attach an IAM role to that instance with the specific privilege. This is very important. See, during development time, it's okay to use access keys. But when you go on to deployment or to production, ensure that you use IAM roles for secure access. Even when you're using a Lambda function, if the Lambda function is accessing an external resource like DynamoDB or S3, ensure that an IAM role is attached to the Lambda function. When it comes to network security, so we've already seen prior that you can use a NAT instance or a NAT gateway to allow an instance in a private subnet to access the internet. If you want an instance in a private subnet to access public resources like DynamoDB, S3 or KMS, remember you can't use the NAT gateway for this. You then have to use a special uh, feature known as BPC endpoints. There are two types of endpoints. First is a gateway endpoint. This is used only when you want your instance to access either S3 or DynamoDB. Next is the interface endpoint. This is when you want to access other services such as KMS. So what you do is that you create a VPC endpoint to your service. You attach it to the VPC and then you can make your instance in the private subnet access that resource via the endpoint. Now for HF, if you want the data during the load or copy process to be private, it should not go via the internet. It only has to go via the VPC. Then you can enable one feature known as Redshift Enhanced VPC Routing. If you want to monitor IP addresses of traffic into your VPC, use VPC flow logs. And remember to use Bastion Host if an administrator needs to administer instances in your private subnet. The Bastion Host will be created in the public subnet. Ensure the right security groups are in place to only allow access to the workstation of the administrator. So this marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. Now in this chapter, I want to discuss the security for your VPC. So this mainly comes under two objectives of how to secure your application tiers and defining the network infrastructure for a single VPC application. So there are two ways you can actually secure your VPC. So first is using security groups. So this can be used to control traffic to your EC2 instances. Now by default, remember that all traffic is denied. And next is network ACLs. So when you want to limit traffic to your subnet, remember to use network ACLs. Remember this important concept from an exam that when you, you know, uh, put a rule in network ACL, it will affect all the instances which are part of that subnet. So be very careful when you're changing network ACLs. Next, if you have malicious traffic, this is always a very common question which can get asked in exam. So if you are getting uh, malicious traffic from a set uh, of IP addresses onto your EC2 instance in a particular subnet, what you can do is that you can use a network ACL to put a deny traffic rule based on those IP addresses. Now, when it comes to putting security groups for your VPC, let's say you have an application load balancer. So users are accessing this application load balancer onto your 
on to your EC2 instance. Let's say your instance is hosting a web server which is listening on port 80. Now when it comes to the security groups, remember that you have different security groups defined for your ELB and uh, you know a different security group defined for your web server. When you look at these security groups, this is how you should actually define this from a security perspective. This is very important from an exam perspective, you can get asked. So for the security group for the elastic load balancer, remember to place a rule for incoming traffic on port 80 from the source has anywhere. Now since the users are going to come, let's say you have an internet facing load balancer and the users need to come from anywhere in the internet, you have to allow port 80, let's say it's only accepting HTTP traffic from the source of anywhere and that too for incoming traffic. If you have an SSL certificate that's installed on your load balancer and you are accepting traffic on port 443, then ensure that the security group for the load balancer accepts on port 443. Next comes the security group for your web instance. So this should not allow traffic from anywhere. This should only allow incoming traffic on port 80. Again, let's say you are only accepting traffic on HTTP. The traffic should only be accepted from the source of the elastic load balancer and not from anywhere. A very important concept for the exam. Again, if your web instance is accepting secure traffic, then change the port to 443. Now, if you have this architecture wherein you have the application load balancer, you have web server, and then you have a database server, then these are the rules which you would put in place. So the only difference is that now for the database security group, it should allow incoming traffic depending upon the type of database server. Over here, I have assumed it's a MySQL database server. So by default, it accepts traffic on port 3306. And here, the source should be the web server. So understand this important concepts of, first of all, the direction of traffic that's incoming, the port numbers, and the source. The source is very important when it comes to the exam. So this marks the end of this chapter when you looked at security for your VPC. Hi and welcome back. Now in this chapter I want to discuss NAT or network address translation. So now this actually comes under multiple uh, layers. So it comes under designing multi architecture solutions, high availability, elasticity and scalability, and even define the security for your single VPC application. So the type of questions you could get on NAT could fall in any one of these categories. So let's try to understand what could get asked in the exam. Now when it comes to NAT itself, so you could have a web server that's in a public subnet, you could have a database server in the private subnet. Now you would define the NAT instance to ensure that servers in your private subnet could communicate securely with the internet without going through the internet gateway. The advantage of using the NAT is that only the database server in this case can reach out to the internet. But from the internet, no one can actually reach your database server. So uh, this is only one way traffic. So if a request is sent from the database server via the NAT instance to the internet, it would get the response back. But there is no way to initiate a request from the internet to the database server by the NAT instance. That will not be allowed. That is where the security aspect comes in when using network address translation. So now the important point is that you have to ensure that the NAT instance is created in the public subnet and not in the private subnet. From an architect point of view, this is very important. And that's because a NAT instance itself should have the ability to communicate with the internet gateway onto the internet. Remember that the NAT instance is used as an intermediate translator for the server in your private subnet. Now, instead of the NAT instance, you can also use a completely managed service known as the NAT gateway. You can simply replace the NAT instance with the NAT gateway but you again have to ensure that when you create the NAT gateway, it has to be created in a public subnet. 
Now, the way you use the NAT gateway is when your NAT instance is becoming a bottleneck. So, let's say that your private servers are issuing a lot of requests. It could be patches that need to be downloaded onto the servers. And then your NAT instance, remember, is depend upon your instance type that has a bandwidth limitation. So, that instance is becoming a bottleneck. The NAT gateway has high bandwidth and can allow a lot of traffic to flow into and out to your subnets. Also use an NAT gateway when you want to have a completely managed service. Remember if you're using a NAT instance, you are responsible for maintaining that NAT instance. You are responsible for the security of the NAT instance. You are responsible for ensuring that the instance is always up and running. But if you want a completely managed service, you don't want to think about it, use the NAT gateway service. When would you want to use a NAT instance? This is when you want to use it has a proxy server as well. Now, if you want high availability for your NAT instance, very important from an exam perspective, you can create an auto scaling group, put uh, the launch configurations for your NAT instance, and you can also have multiple NAT instances in multiple availability zones for high availability. If you want high availability for your NAT gateway, ensure that you create multiple NAT gateways in multiple availability zones. So this marks the end of this chapter. In this, I just want to sh you know tell you about NAT and the high availability of network address transition which you can have in your VPC. Hi and welcome back. Now in this chapter, we're going to look at encryption. So now when it comes to EBS volumes, remember that you can enable encryption for your EBS volumes using the customer key which is defined in the AWS KMS service. This needs to be done during the volume creation time. If you already have an existing volume, you cannot enable encryption. But what you can do is that you can use uh, OS level tools such as for example BitLocker for Windows for enabling encryption of the files on the particular volume. Now when it comes to the relation database service, you can also enable encryption of the underlying database files. So this can be done for the databases in the AWS RDS service or even for Amazon Aurora. One key thing to note is that when you enable encryption, it will automatically also encrypt all the logs and snapshots. So when you create the database, you will actually have the screen. So you can enable encryption and choose what is the master key uh, to use for encryption. This will be coming from the KMS service. Even when it comes to DynamoDB, you can enable encryption of the DynamoDB table again only at creation time. In the simple storage service, very important, you can use server-side encryption. So here what AWS will do is that before it stores the object on the physical uh, server, it will actually encrypt the object, store it on the server. When you get the object back, when you issue a GET request, the AWS Simple Storage Service will automatically decrypt the object and give the object back to you. Now, when you use server-side encryption, you have three ways. First is using AWS Managed Keys. So here, everything is managed by AWS. You don't have to worry about anything. So this is good for companies wherein they don't want the headache of managing keys. Or you can have something in between wherein you can use the key management service from AWS. Here you have control over the keys, but you don't have complete control over something known as the key material. But then nevertheless, you, you, know, you have the option of managing the life cycle of the keys in the KMS service. So you have the option of defining customer keys in KMS and then using that to encrypt the objects in the S3 bucket. Finally, you can also use customer managed keys. So when you are uploading the object in your application, then you can send the key. AWS will then take the key and encrypt and decrypt the object for you. You can also use client side encryption uh, wherein you at the programming level will first encrypt the object and then send it across onto the simple storage service. 
Now the key management service, this is a fully managed key service from AWS. Here you can define your keys, define, uh, you can manage the life cycle of your keys. You can use the keys for encrypting objects. So the customer, man the customer keys are used to generate data keys and these data keys are used for encryption. You then have the cloud hardware security module service. This is when you want complete control over your keys. Your AWS has no visibilities of the keys you create. So sometimes you might want to use this service from a compliance perspective, from a security perspective. When you use the service, a hardware device gets assigned to your VPC. You then access it via an IP. So you, uh, you know, you send a request from that IP and then you will get a key which can be used to encrypt and decrypt your data. So this marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. So now in this chapter, let's look at the performance for some of the services in AWS. So this comes under the performant objective, which is very important from an exam perspective. So when you look at DynamoDB, one of the most important things that you can get asked because this is a new service which is available in DynamoDB. This is DynamoDB Acceleration. So this is an in-memory cache which is available for DynamoDB. Now this is normally used when companies, like uh, companies use DynamoDB and they have millions of requests per second on the DynamoDB table. So when they want to reduce the latency, they can use this DynamoDB Acceleration. This creates an in-memory cache for DynamoDB so that those uh, that data which is queried more often will be stored in the cache. It's sort of like having elastic cache in front of a relation database system. But in this, you have an in-memory cache which is part of the DynamoDB service. So this is good when you have millions of requests for a DynamoDB table and you want to reduce the latency of the access to that particular table. Another important aspect when it comes to performance from an exam perspective is the Amazon S3. So when you are having workloads, so let's say you are having an application that's having more than 100 requests per second, this could be get or put requests for objects in an Amazon S3 bucket then you have to think about performance. If your requests are below 100, then Amazon S3 has a service will ensure that it scales accordingly to take on that performance hit. But then you as a customer, if you feel that the number of requests is going to exceed a particular threshold, like 100 over here, then AWS recommends that you put some practices in place when you're uploading your objects for better performance. Now, one key thing to remember is that when you're uploading objects, you have the entire key name. So Amazon S3 uses this key name to create partitions and then store the objects based on that partitions. And then it creates an index in order to find the objects in a particular partition. This is how Amazon S3 gets and puts object in that service. So for better performance, it's always good when you have keys that are distributed across multiple partitions. Let's look at an example of this quickly. So let's say you have a demo bucket, right? You're storing images in that bucket as per a particular date. So here all the dates are constant. The name of the images or the key of the images is changing. But unfortunately, since you're using date for the underlying folder, what the Amazon S3 service will do, it will create one partition based on that date and it will store all the image objects in that particular partition. Now it's okay if you have a few number of objects, but when the number of objects starts increasing, that's when you take a performance hit because all of the, you know, the input and output is being concentrated on that one single partition. So you have to take care when creating keys so that they are distributed across multiple partitions. So it becomes easier to fetch data across these multiple partitions. So how can you change the key naming to ensure multiple partitions are created 
when you're using objects in the S3 service. Let's look at the same example, but this time what we're doing is that we're adding another kind of key value before each of the dates and these are unique key values. So what AWS recommends is that to have a random hash prefix as part of the key during the upload process. This will result in better performance for both your GET and your PUT requests. Now let's come to networking. Now performance in networking, if you want your EC2 instance to have better networking capabilities, then think of using EC2 instance with enhanced networking. As an architect, you should be knowing this. If you want low latency between the instances, so you want data to be transferred easily between instances, then think of placing them in a placement group. The only key thing to remember is that the placement group, the instances should be in the same availability zone. This is a prime requirement. Next, if you want, uh, there is also an option of EBS optimized. So if you want better optimization of your underlying volumes, then you can choose this instance type. The instance type will actually mention that this is EBS optimized. If you want uh, better connections between your on-premise environment and AWS, you want a dedicated connection, low latency, then use AWS Direct Connect. If you want encryption, so if you want encryption of traffic between on-premise and AWS, then think of using Amazon Manage Virtual Private Network Connections. Remember that in AWS Direct Connect alone, it achieves low latency of data, but there is no encryption of the data when it passes between both the locations. So if you want both, if you want both low latency and encryption, then what you do first is that you can create a direct connect connection first and then create an AWS VPN or a virtual private network connection over the existing direct connect connection all important when you are an architect. Remember, as an architect for the exam, you have to understand several aspects. So it's not only about managing environments, it's also about managing security, managing networking. So all of these are very important aspects for the exam. So this marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. So now in this chapter, let's look at the operational excellence viewpoint from the exam perspective. So what's important when you're looking at operational excellence? Well, the first and most important thing is to always look towards ease of use when you're looking at the services in AWS and always look towards using automation. Now, if you have a microservices based application and you need orchestration, choose the Elastic Container Service. So in the Elastic Container Service, which also now has support for Kubernetes, you can actually orchestrate the containers for your microservices based application. It also has the option of auto scaling. So if you're looking at a microservices based application, choose the Elastic Container Service. Next, if you want to quickly provision development environments, use Elastic Beanstalk. So maybe you have your development community, you as the architect for the application, you want the development community to start working on the prototype for your application. And maybe you want to spin up a quick development environment. You can do that using Elastic Beanstalk. Even if you have a custom environment which makes use of Docker containers, you can still use Elastic Beanstalk. So in a question, if you do get this uh, point on quickly provisioning development environments or if you want to create custom environments in Docker, you can use the Elastic Beanstalk service. If you want to automate provisioning of your infrastructure, if this is the question, then make sure you look at using CloudFormation. So remember in CloudFormation, you can design templates. These templates can be used to spin up resources on the AWS cloud. And finally, if you have configuration tools, which companies are using like Chef for their on-premise environments or servers, and you want to start using AWS, then think of using the AWS Ops Work Service because this has inbuilt support for Chef recipes. When looking at scalability, think of auto-scaling. 
So whether it be your web tier, your application tier, even your proxy servers, your NAT instances, think of using auto scaling for managing the scalability of these different underlying layers. Also remember to put the right conditions for scale in and scale out. So you as an architect, when you're being asked questions in the exam on scalability, don't limit yourself to only scalability of a particular tier like the web tier. You can have different levels or layers in your application which can be scaled via an auto scaling group. Next, when looking at managing deployments, if you need to, the best way to manage deployments is using blue green deployments. You learn more about this when you're doing the DevOps engineering, but if you do get a question on blue green deployments, think of using Route 53 for managing your traffic. So you can use Route 53 with the weighted routing policy to route percentage of traffic onto different environments in blue green deployments. Next, when it comes to failure. So remember when you're designing your application, you're an architect, you have to design with failure in mind. So in case if your main web application fails and you want to have a cost effective failover site, what you can do is that you can create a static website using the simple storage service. You can then have a failover policy in Route 53 to route your traffic in case your primary web instance goes down, your primary website goes down and you can direct users to a static website in the simple storage service. Remember that the health checks in Route 53 can also detect failures not only of services in AWS, but it can also detect the failures of your services in your on-premise infrastructure because these health checks are, you know, can be based on the TCP protocol where it does these heartbeats to check if your uh, destination uh, service is up and running. If you have used across the globe and you want excellence in terms of delivery of traffic, remember that you can use CloudFront, very important from an exam perspective. You could have a static website hosted in an S3 bucket. You could have a web application hosted on an EC2 instance. All of this can be used as an origin and you can use CloudFront to distribute your traffic. AWS Lambda is the service for automation. If you get questions on any sort of automation, think of AWS Lambda. So some use cases, you can use CloudWatch events to see if your instance has been compromised. You can then use a Lambda function to terminate the instance. Another use case, let's say you have an application which is storing objects in S3. Now let's say there is some certain metadata that gets stored along with the object as part of your application. So let's say you have your privileged users as part of your application who is paying money for your service and you want their objects to get more preference. So what you can do is that you can add metadata in the object being uploaded saying that this is a privileged user. But how do you come to know who are the privileged users and what are the objects they have? What you can do is that you can have a Lambda function which can be attached to an S3 event so that whenever the object is uploaded, it will read the metadata in the object and then create a row in a DynamoDB table. This is how you can use Lambda for this sort of automation. So this marks the end of this chapter. Hi and welcome back. So now in conclusion, uh, I just want to talk about the exam itself. Now in the exam, you could get similar questions on the same topic. So I do reiterate this to students who are going to take the exam. Now for example, in one of the exams, I got three to four similar type of questions on EBS volume types. And, and that's why I actually included a chapter in this course which explained the EBS volume types. In another, I got three to four questions just on high availability for AWS RDS. So in my quizzes, if you're taking any one of my practice tests, do not think that these type of questions will not come in the exam. So I said, I've given the exam twice and I have seen this repetitive type of questioning on the same topic. 
Now, as part of this quiz, I have a sampler quiz of 20 questions. I have a separate course, which is completely dedicated to practice test on the associate level exams. So currently I have two quizzes available of 65 questions each, which is again relevant to the pattern of what gets asked on the AWS solution architect associate exam. There is also currently a quiz in that practice test on the AWS cloud practitioner. And I'm currently working on writing the quiz because it does take time to write the quiz and write the explanation. So I'm doing it currently for the AWS SysOps administrator. And in the next week, I'm going to be giving the AWS developer June 2018 release. So in the question bank for that course, by the end of this month, I'm going to have two question banks on each of the associate level certification exams. So you can check the bonus lecture in this course. I have a discount coupon, again, the normal for 9.99 USD. So with this coupon, you will get access to question banks on all the associate level exams. So instead of you purchasing separate courses on separate practice tests for separate exams, I am putting everything as part of one complete course. So you can use the discount coupon to get this course. I'll just quickly show you how the questions have been framed in that particular practice test course. Now for each quiz, I've actually divided the questions into the different domains. So these are the domains which are part of the objectives. When you look at the objectives of the AW Solution Architect Associate exam, you will get your score. I've put a 75% scoring percentage as part of the quiz itself. If you are taking the quiz, I urge you to aim higher. It just gives you that more level of confidence when you're going for the exam. And when you go on to review questions, now for each and every question, I've ensured first that they're all scenario based questions because this is what gets asked in the exam most frequently. I provide what is the right option and I've provided a detailed explanation on why this is the right option. So you can go through all of the questions, get the explanation and remember all of these questions is based on the exact concepts which get asked in the AWS Solution Architect Associate.